Today on The Hookup, I'm gonna show you seven of the biggest mistakes that people make when building a smart home and how to avoid them for a convenient, long-lasting, trouble-free experience. Smart home tech isn't just about colored lights and smart speakers. It's a way to add functionality, convenience, and peace of mind to your home. But if you do it incorrectly, it can cause a lot more headaches than it's worth. So today, let's look at seven things that I wish everyone, including myself, knew before starting to add smart devices to their house. Starting with what has to be the biggest and least talked about failure, not understanding that no matter what, every smart home can have occasional bugs. It doesn't matter how much money you spend or how much research you do, something will always eventually break and need to be fixed. I've been in multi-million dollar mansions with smart systems from Control 4, Savant, and Elan, and I've also stayed in smart homes with hundreds of DIY devices in them. And the only difference is that when something goes wrong in a professionally installed system, you call your installer to fix it. But in a DIY system, it's gonna be up to you. But as long as you go into it understanding that increasing the complexity of a system will always increase its likelihood to break, you can make choices that will reduce any headache of those inevitable issues that you might run into. And that's where failure number two comes in, which is replacing your normal functionality with smart functionality. There's a great saying by the comedian Mitch Hedberg that an escalator can never break, it can only become stairs. And that's the mentality that you should use when it comes to your smart home. If installing smart light bulbs mean you need to put covers over your switches or installing smart curtains means you can no longer open them by hand, then you're really setting yourself up for failure. When choosing your smart devices, make sure that they maintain as much original functionality as possible and be aware of how they behave when they lose connection to the internet, hub, or Wi-Fi and never replace critical lower tech devices like smoke detectors or water shutoff valves with smart technology. But instead, you can add smart devices in line and in addition to your existing equipment if you wanna add more functionality to them. A great test to run to see how your smart home performs is what I call an increasing outage test. Start by disconnecting your cable modem from the router to see what happens to your smart home devices when they lose a cloud connection. If they pass that first level, then you can unplug any hubs that you might be using like Home Assistant, SmartThings, or Hubitat for Wi-Fi, Zigbee, and Z-Wave devices, or your Matter Bridge if you have newer Matter-supported devices, and see how they act without a connection to their hub. And the last and most critical test is the ultimate worst case scenario for a smart home, and that's bringing your entire local network down by unplugging your router and access points from power. During all these tests, it is completely expected for your automations to break, but what's really important is what minimum functionality your devices maintain, and whether your devices will come back online on their own or whether they're gonna need additional attention before resuming normal functionality. As hard as I've tried, my smart home absolutely isn't perfect, but when at all possible, I try to prioritize devices with local control, meaning they don't need an internet connection or a manufacturer cloud to operate. In the past, this meant doing things like taking switches apart, soldering, writing code, and installing custom firmware, which really limited the market. But the newer Matter Smart Home standard aims to solve all that by focusing on ease of use, local control, and interoperability between different smart device manufacturers. Which again is something that I've had the pleasure of experiencing for the last five years using great projects like Home Assistant and Tasmoda, but it's really exciting to see Matter taking these concepts more mainstream. When you're doing these tests, walk through your house and check on all of your smart devices. Look at things like, can you still turn your lights on and off with a switch? For me, I know that my bedroom light switch normally turns on my bedside lamps, window valence LEDs, and these Govi table lamps through various automations. But without a Wi-Fi connection, the switch just goes back to standard functionality, which controls just the switched outlet for my bedside lamps. And while that's not ideal, it's also exactly the same situation that I'd be in if I hadn't installed any smart devices at all. If you have cloud-only devices, make sure you know exactly what will and will not work in the event of an outage. Regretfully, my eight sleep mattress is fully cloud reliant and is basically a brick without internet access, meaning I have no access to its sensors and it won't heat or cool the bed during an outage. But the good news is, even without the heating, cooling, and sleep analytics, it's still a mattress and you can still sleep on it, so Mitch Hedberg would approve. And it does tend to come back online all on its own, so if there's a brief internet outage or cloud outage during the day, I'll never even notice it. Last, above all, the most important thing to check during these tests is to make sure that there aren't any safety issues like possible fires or floods that could be caused by malfunctioning devices during an outage. As you run these tests, it's also useful to write down any strange behavior that you see or hear, like beeping, flashing, or other strange motor noises, so you can refer back to your notes if you ever hear those noises in the future. And that brings me to failure number three, which is not properly documenting what you've added and what you've changed in your house. I've been very lucky to have my YouTube channel and website to be able to refer back to when I need to fix an issue or replace a device. Very often when I'm automating things, I'll go through a relatively long series of trial and error before getting it exactly right. And normally that feels like a huge accomplishment at the time. 
which I think is a really common thing in this hobby. However, just because you felt accomplished in that moment, don't think that you're just gonna remember how you got it to work a few years later when it's time to change or fix something. Sometimes I look at my own code and I know that it took me hours to write it, but a couple years later, I have absolutely no idea what it does or why I wrote it. Whatever works for you, whether it's pictures, video, a Word file, or an Excel file, make sure that you document everything so you can save yourself a ton of time and effort in the future and so you won't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And speaking of reinventing the wheel, that is smart home failure number four. Don't try to engineer your own solution when a fairly priced, high performing solution already exists. One of my favorite woodworking quotes is, why would I buy that piece of furniture when I can make one that's almost as good for twice the price? When I started my YouTube channel, one of my first videos was about making my own window contact sensors. I used 3D printing and off-the-shelf parts to make each contact sensor for about $5 in parts. And at the time, this made a lot of sense to me and it was worth the effort because a single smart home contact sensor was around $40, meaning I could make eight of my DIY sensors for the same price as a single off-the-shelf sensor. But fast forward five years and high quality Zigbee and Z-Wave contact sensors are under $10, don't need to be 3D printed and soldered together, look nicer and perform significantly better than my DIY solution. So it doesn't really make sense anymore. Don't get me wrong, DIY stuff is definitely great and if you're doing it for fun and for the learning experience, then more power to you. But in 2023, good products do exist at a reasonable cost for most of your home automation needs and are worth checking out before deciding to go to the DIY route. And not only have smart home device prices plummeted in the last few years, but compatibility between manufacturers is also at an all-time high. And that leads me to fail number five, which is feeling like you're locked inside of a single smart home ecosystem. For the last five years, it's been pretty common for people to define their smart home with what platform they're using. You'd say things like, oh yeah, this is a HomeKit smart home, or my house runs on Home Assistant. But with Matter finally being released and implemented by big smart home players, all of your Matter devices will be able to talk to each other so you can automate on as many different platforms as you want. For instance, consider this Matter-supported Govee M1 LED strip. Typically, in the past, when you bought a new device, you'd go to the manufacturer's app and use that app to connect that device to your network. This would obviously require you to have the Govee app, and then you'd be limited to whatever smart home skills and integrations Govee had designed for things like Google Home, Amazon Echo, and HomeKit. However, with a Matter-enabled device, you just decide which platform you want to use as your Matter controller, like Amazon Echo, Apple HomeKit, or Google Home. And then you add the strip directly to those platforms without going through the Govee cloud or app at all. The even cooler thing is that if you still have devices that are only compatible with one of these systems, you can share a Matter device across all platforms. And whenever you change the state of the device on one platform, it quickly updates to the rest of them. And the best part of that is that it does all of it locally. So not only is it fast, but it's also more resilient to internet and cloud server outages, which will ultimately make it a lot more reliable. Now, unfortunately, Matter is still in early days, so not every single device type is available and some advanced functionality that you have in the Govee app like creating different patterns and scenes can't be accessed when you add it directly via a Matter controller. But overall the future looks really bright as Matter starts to mature and I'm getting more and more optimistic about the future of the interconnected smart home for less technical people. And speaking of those less technical people, let's talk about smart home failure number six, which is underestimating the value of convenience. The most common comment on my automated blinds video is something to the effect of, this is too much work, I'm just gonna stand up, walk over to the blinds and open them myself. And a very common sentiment in my robotic vacuum video comments is these are too expensive, I'll just vacuum the floor myself. And while I understand the feelings behind both of these comments, the big question is, are you actually doing those things? If you manually vacuum and mop your floors every day, then more power to you, great job. But the majority of us don't do that. And of course you can open and close your blinds by hand, but how many times have you just decided to keep them closed all day instead of getting up and opening them yourself? Subtle things like a clean floor, a well-lit room, and an outside view have a huge impact on your mood. And when you're not feeling great, it's really hard to motivate yourself to do the things that would make you feel better. Having those things automated means you won't have to worry about them at all and you get all their benefits without having to put forth any additional effort. Plus, who doesn't like having robots do their bidding? And that leads to failure number seven, which is not having fun with it. If you fall into the set of users who maybe has one or two Wi-Fi smart plugs and a robotic vacuum, then this might not apply to you. And if all you wanna do is live in an automated home without the journey, then paying a professional might be the best option if your bank account can handle it. 
However, if you are one of the hundreds of thousands of people who wants to go the DIY route and you want your house to be fully automated with things like motion sensors, automated window coverings, switches, outlets, vacuums, LED lighting, and more, then you need to have at least some interest in smart home as a hobby. And the journey should be fun. There are tons of home automation forums, Discord groups, and Facebook groups full of people that are happy to help you, and tons of awesome YouTube channels offering great ideas and advice for free. My best piece of advice for keeping the enjoyment in your smart home building process is to start small. Don't go out and buy 50 devices and install them all in a weekend. Take it from someone who routinely sets up, tests, and learns five to 10 different devices in a two week period. Not only is it an overwhelming amount of work, but adding that many devices that fast makes it really hard to troubleshoot issues. And unless it's your full-time job, you're not gonna have enough time to learn absolutely everything there is to know about every single device. Instead, take your time, learn the basics by automating something that isn't super critical. And then when you start to feel more and more confident, you can branch out, buy more stuff, and increase the complexity of your automations. And that's it, avoiding those seven mistakes will massively increase your chances of having a pleasant, convenient, and long-lasting smart home. Did I miss a smart home mistake that you made? Let me know down in the comments. If you want to see the rest of my smart home, I've got a link to my most recent house tour from a month ago down in the description, as well as some links to my favorite products that I showed in this video. And as always, I appreciate if you use those links, since as an Amazon affiliate, I do earn a small commission on the sale at no cost to you. I'd also like to thank all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for their continued support of my channel. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.